one. Sorry about that. I'm really sorry about that. Just got caught up there. Hello, hello. I think you can hear me now. Good afternoon. It's uh, the 20. 8th of April, we're on the pond, and uh, we've got a bit of a wind out of the south today. It's actually just picked up. It's supposed to rain uh, in a bit. Uh, today was a really nice day to get out on the pond. Uh, I want to uh, share some stuff. I wanted to get out of the house, and uh, today's intention is to just to share the stuff that I'm really geeking out about these days here let's just pick that up a bit there we go there we go so we're on the pond and we're just going to go for a row i'm just going to share some uh concepts and things i've come across you know i've uh for those that don't know i'm brent Bashera. i served in the canadian military for 24 years i served overseas got back from afghanistan in march of 04 and I uh, left the military and had, you know, came at a cost, came at a price. And with that, we've learned to process those experiences, right? Uh, I got back from Afghanistan in March of 04. And uh, I just want to say that for myself, I wanted to see it firsthand. I wanted to see it with my own eyes. and. Uh, I'm very thankful to have had that experience and to share it in it with my uh, brothers and sisters in the military and who understand what's involved when you dedicate your life to such service and how to come to terms and like the psychologist says learn to process those experiences learn to as he says deal with it now it's years later and and that's what I've you know, figured out for myself is the processing and the dealing with that, those experiences, emotions, and events. And uh, I've covered that in uh, those in my previous videos. Today's uh, video is more of just the stuff that I'm really geeking out about the, uh, these days. Uh, we're living in amazing times, but we're also living in uh, truly polarized. Uh, trying times and we've said that before and so how we can be the best possible service as I'm figuring out is to be the best me that I can and the phrase is do more of that which makes you happy and uh, less of that which doesn't and so that's what I'm about these days is using the Wim Hof method to help me process my uh, previous experiences or PTSDs uh, check out WimHoffMethod.com. Truly inspiring individual. Um, and uh, so I find for myself that when I just follow the things that uh, make me happy, happier, and letting go of the things that no longer serve me or longer uh, provide that happiness or that understanding in my life, I just let that stuff go. And that's again the the game of that. The game of letting those things go so you know with all the media information uh, again thank you so much if you're listening to this again <laughs> you might have some spare time on your hands um, 
So the stuff that I'm geeking out about these days is everything from tribal wisdoms to current quantum understandings. And uh, the stuff that's really, um, I find inspiring is, is that we have uh, the scientists of today are like the, the prophets of yesterday. They're all, they're the ones that now are providing for us the, the wisdoms, the learning, the uh, what's, how to uh, figure out the, uh, the, this natural world around us. And what's, what's neat is we've got those uh, scientists today that are able to meter things because for a scientist today using the scientific method, uh, which is what they use, scientists today use their scientific method to meter the world and explain it to us. They disassemble it and dissect it, and, uh, and then, then, then they're able to describe it for us. So the scientists of today are like the uh, prophets, the sages, mages, magis, the gurus, the Sifis, Sufis, uh, and the sages, the medicine men and medicine women of, uh, of our day. And they're able to describe the world because they've been able to meter it. And for them, if they can't meter it, it doesn't matter. Uh, where I like to hang out with the current quantum understanding and the current quantum uh, physics and the physicists and the current uh, understanding of our consciousness, what's neat is the scientists of today using their machines and their uh, meters to meter the world, to measure it, because if they can't measure it, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't matter, they can't measure it. And uh, so what they have now is a dialogue and a description of um, consciousness as much as they can in, in the realms that they can. And basically what they're doing is saying the same thing that that man or woman wearing a loincloth 5,000 years ago, meditating, sitting in India, uh, has been saying all along that we're all connected at, a, at the subatomic, the quantum level, at the quark level. There's this uh, connection to everything. Once you dissolve and uh, break it all down it actually everything joins at the very very basic level of life and the, the current quantum physicists are saying that in that zero point of energy that complete vacuum of energy that there's still tremblings of uh, things happening and that they're figuring out that we should be able to tap into that uh, energy and that's that they're calling that zero point energy just want to point out here uh, across the pond that uh, behind me to my starboard here, you'll see this house right here. Uh, when we left, um, uh, uh, when we left Ontario, when we left uh, where we lived last, we always wanted to live close to family. Uh, what's kind of neat is uh, this cabin here was built by Kellyanne's uh, great uncle Jack and uh, her mom and her aunts and uncles used to swim in this pond when they were kids so you know we can't get much closer to family unless we were living with mom right now so um, you know there's Galileo's of our time people like Dean Radin Tom Campbell Bruce Lipton Mario Martinez uh, Wim Hof uh, you know Joe Rogan's got a part in that um, people like uh, Mary uh, Marty Rosenblatt, uh, we have uh, Russell Targ, uh, we have Hal Putoff. You know, these men are the uh, Galileos of our time. And what they're doing is they're pushing the leading edge of our uh, conscious understanding, uh, you know, what it means to be, uh, to live in this reality. They're, they're pushing the envelope of, um, the, of consciousness, of science. You know, and uh, there's so much more to know. You know, there's so much more technologies that we're going to build. There's so much more uh, medicines and architectures and things like this that we don't even have names for. There's going to be jobs that are created, being created, and will be created that we don't even have names for yet and, and, and technologies and stuff like that. So um, what's really I'm finding exciting in, in this because I have the luxury um, you know, through design, and that's what my bride and I, Kellyanne, have worked towards is being uh, the creators of our own life. Like the phrase says, the best way to predict the future is create it. And so that's what we're both really, really about is really getting at, uh, at our thing, the things that truly geek us out about. And I find that when we uh, lean into that, that there's a reciprocity, there's a quid pro quo that the 
uh, the matrix, the environment, the universe, the divine uh, corresponds and seems to collaborate with that energetic profile. Smile and the world smiles with you. And same thing with the, uh, you know, cry and you cry alone. And that's, if, and that's the difference between focusing on what's right and what's here and what we do have versus what's wrong and what's missing. And um, there's times to do that, certainly, but when you lament and you cause yourself grief, then that's semi-neurotic, uh, expecting things to change by doing the same thing over and over. And uh, if we do what we've always done, we're going to get what we've, al what we've always got. So um, the things that I'm really geeking out about is, again, these scientists now uh, are saying basically exactly what the sages uh, Sifus and Sufis have been saying all along that because now they, they, they're starting to get an understanding because they can measure it. They, they're starting to measure the, uh, the quantum world with their machines. And now we have uh, super glimpses of that with um, uh, back in the uh, 70s, uh, the CIA, uh, there was a book released called The uh, what's it? Uh, Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and that was released, and I think from what I've seen on YouTube, that that's what motivated the, the CIA to come up uh, with their own um, psychic program. And uh, so they invested money into it for over 20 years, you know, millions and millions of dollars. So, you know, uh, they've, they've released that it, it's not, uh, it wasn't valid technology, but you know, when you have to answer to the budgetary committee, uh, you know, they, they don't, the government doesn't give out money for things for 20 years if, if there wasn't valid uh, research. And so that's what Russell Targ and Hal put off uh, together with the psychic uh, Ingo Swan and later uh, uh, Joe McGonigal and uh, uh, Lynn Buchanan and others, uh, Hella Hammett, uh, they, you know, were able through scientific studies and measures able to see that, yeah, their psychic uh, powers, psychic abilities, psychic sensitivities, our own intuition, if you want to call, is a very real thing. And, uh, you know, we've had that uh, you know, happen in our own lives. Rupert Sheldrake has two wonderful studies. One is uh, your dog owners know when you come home, and the other one is the feeling of being stared at. Uh, Rupert uh, has done studies where uh, people will be sitting in a room with a with a button, and then a person will have, and on them will be a camera, and the other person in an isolated room will have uh, the, the camera viewing device. Uh, the person in the isolated room, because they're both separated, uh, can tell when he presses or she presses the button knows that they're being watched at and that's that's truly cool and I don't know if you've had this but the feeling of being stared at when all of a sudden you're standing in a group and you get that sensation and you look over and there's someone looking right at you I remember in the infantry the Sarge always said uh, when we when we were learning uh, to do a silent sentry takeout that's what they do in the army uh, to never stare to not look at the spine because that would uh, alert the sentry. So why is my sergeant telling us that? So uh, basically psychic, uh, our psychic abilities or powers or our intuition, and that's what Edgar Cayce says, is our intuition is our greatest psychic gift. Our gut check, our gut feeling, you know, how, do, how does it resonate in our body? And so, uh, you know, one of the things, uh, uh, so I can't say four things at the same time. So, um, uh, they did scientific studies with these uh, remote viewers and uh, through the uh, uh, um, innovators, innovativeness of the, uh, the natural psychic Ingo Swan, they were able to develop, with Hal Putoff and Russell Targ, able to develop um, 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 scenarios or experiments where they're able to, you know, register and qualify and write down and measure, you know, the uh, scientific abilities and so what they came up with eventually was uh, remote viewing where someone there's two people in a room the psychic or the viewer and the uh, uh, handler per se and then a person would go out and they would would look at an object person place a thing somewhere out in the real world and at the prescribed time uh, the viewer would start perceiving what the the uh, outbound personality was seen or experiencing and with uh, amazing accuracy um, I read a book called how to improve your your ESP 
uh, extra sensory perception. And that's, I feel, what is rather than remote viewing, you're more, more remote perceiving, and that's the experiences I've seen. It's more remote perceiving with all of our senses because, again, at the subatomic level, all of our senses are connected into the waves of potentiality, the waves of what's happening. And, and I'm going to go more into this in, in more uh, details in, in future pond casts. Um, uh, so what Russell Targ, Hal Putoff, and Ingo Swan were able to do is, is do other, other uh, pre-cognition, uh, other uh, tests where they're able to perceive things that happened in the future. Uh, Hella Hammett, I believe, was the one that uh, they were going to do this outbound exercise where the, the viewer would go out and experience things. And you can look this all up on YouTube and there's some amazing articles and amazing um, discussions and they talk about this. So just look that up. Uh, I just want to touch the, the top of it so that we can really uh, just open it up for discussion. Again, this is the stuff that I'm geeking out about because I've had the luxury through uh, through the work that my bride and I have done to be able to, you know, not live off the grid per se, but to have create a lifestyle that we really, really enjoy. And that's what um, I'm about and that's what she's about and our friends are about. So um, let's see here. So again, the, for me, it's the luxury of being able to study this stuff, to research it and then apply it to my own life. Um, let's see what else. Uh, so um, yeah, so this one exercise, Hella Hammett had a, a meeting to go to. They were going to run the exercise at 10, but she needed to go to a doctor's appointment or something like that. So she wrote down where the site was and wrote down her her uh, session before the uh, before a couple hours before the experiment even ran. And the target, because what they do is they, they draw from, I believe, six envelopes, and then they would go out to the site. Once they get out to... A, one location they would open up and then move from that A location to the B location and then that's where the session would be perceived to. And so Hella, she didn't have the time to to, uh, to wait around so she did her session before the boys went out so she left, uh, they closed her, she left her session there in an envelope, they went out and did it and then when they got back they compared the notes and, and she definitely had uh, a direct hit. So that's the power of our, uh, our, our psychic abilities, our intuition, is we can perceive uh, any person, place, or thing in space or time. And that's what these uh, the remote viewers have now really opened up for us to be able to qualify and quantify our understanding of the, uh, the world around us. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. No, no, it's just my best guess right it's just my best guess and that's the uh, the beauty of all of this is uh, it just works for me and uh, my intuition now is becoming way way more powerful more accurate uh, and it has I've had great intuition my whole life sometimes I've listened to it with success and sometimes I haven't listened to it and uh, you know and experienced the results therefore of so um, uh, so these the psychics and the CIA have now qualified, you know, with humongous evidence, uh, uncontroversible evidence of our natural psychic abilities. Uh, Dean Radin, the chief scientist, again a man of measurement, uh, talks in his uh, lectures of how we've been collecting. Um, uh, psychic uh, tests. We've been doing psychic tests since the 1860s. Our paranormal, our para, uh, paranormal abilities. They say they're para, but really they're not really para at all. They're just our natural abilities. But for a couple of thousand years, we've been led to believe that we're less than, right? That we're smaller than. But that's not the uh, the truth at all. We're truly magnificent beings in the universe. You know, we have a hundred billion brain cells in our brain and that's the same amount of stars in our galaxy I think that's pretty profound um, you know where's the edge of a galaxy have you ever thought of that that's kind of cool where's the edge of a galaxy so um, there's uh, Ingo Swan's got a great book uh, how to uh, uh, improve your ESP and uh, another book called Penetration, his tell-all story of his work with the uh, CIA and his, his uh, and the scientists of the time, the Stanford Research Institute, and just really showed how amazing 
our gifts are you know and in later episodes I'm going to talk about the synchronicities that I've had in my life uh, today I just want to really cover you know uh, the cream of the stuff that really I'm geeking out about the to how to increase our ESP Harold Sherman um, his book how to improve your ESP I have a, a copy I got a signed copy on uh, Amazon I don't know if it was really signed but it, it, it says signed anyways Harold did an experiment uh, back in 1954 um, this uh, Swedish scientific team got lost up in the Arctic somewhere and uh, so they said we need to send a really qualified guy so they got this major uh, to go up north and Harold heard about this and he wanted to do this uh, remote perceiving long-range uh, communication mind-to-mind -mind communication and so he um, had the major each night um, let's raise this up a little bit get more of the there we go um, each night at 10 o'clock um, just write down his thoughts of the day and then Harold in his own uh, at his own time in his time zone he would write down what he was perceiving of the majors um, day and what was neat was communication wasn't really um, global back in 1954 and uh, so there was a man who had a wireless technology and he was able to uh, try with through radio contact keep in touch with the major but communication was sparse and so Harold each night he would sit down and he would just in his book he would just write down the things that he was perceiving of what the major was uh, experiencing um, at one point Harold in his note says well I'm perceiving snow in my face and loud noises uh, then the next day he says oh my gosh what's I'm at a ball with in a in a uniform um, and just a bunch of other things and what's neat is when the major got back at like three or four months later they're able to compare notes the um, the snow and the loud noise was him flying in uh, um, uh, 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 a plane one of those open open uh, um, open airplanes where you're open back in the day where two pilots would sit and uh, and you know you're exposed to the elements that kind of uh, bushcraft uh, and then um, the very next day he's up in Edmonton and there there is a ball and so he's goes from this major flight to in the open atmosphere of, of snow and rushing wind from the propeller to the next day being at a ball with music and uh, happy people. Uh, what was neat was after the three, four months of Harold keeping a journal and the major keeping a journal that they compared the notes and uh, Harold's notes were actually 80% more accurate than what the man with the radio had. And this is mind to mind communication over hundreds and uh, thousands of miles over an extended period of time so that's pretty profound and in Harold's book he um, all of his stuff because he's a man of science he uh, would only include it if he had two or more people witness the uh, the event the psychic event or the intuitive event and he would have um, them sign an affidavit so that's pretty cool too the reason why I really want to share this this information of our psychic abilities is to really let let you know that we're much more way more magnificent than what we're portrayed to be and have been portrayed to be for the last couple of thousand years and so because now I've had the luxury to research and understand uh, I just want to share this because if you can apply this to your life you know you can be um, informed of when uh, harm comes to your family or how many times have you heard of someone not getting on a flight because they said uh, it doesn't feel right and so they don't get on that flight and maybe that flight crashes um, and so our intuition of um, waking up in the middle of the night and hearing uh, a loved one's voice and then realizing that uh, when you wake up that that person has passed away or getting a dream from from that person that uh, passed away in in the night you know there's many many accounts and so the scientists 
because we couldn't measure that stuff before. So people who were sensitive and were able to describe the stuff because of their, uh, their, their telepathy, their ability to read minds, the ability to perceive any person, place, or thing in space or time, uh, you know, people, because of our ego and such, would perceive these people because we, we have secrets, we're human, right? And so these, our, our fears is what drove, I think, you know, the witch hunts and, and, and those things, burning witches at the stake, you know, things like that. Uh, that's where that comes from. And we still have a bit of that stigma today, but we all have this natural intuitive ability. And that's, that's just what I want to share. And when we practice it, it's no different. It's a sense. It's our sixth sense, no different than our eyes or ears. And if you're not applying it and not using it, then it's like not applying your, your sight or your hearing or your smell or your, your, your sense of touch. So uh, I feel it's important for myself because I've had wondrous, wondrous experiences of, of intuition, of listening to the, the inner voice. I've, with that, I've uh, created my dream job. My, I, I found my dream spouse and together we've, we've created our dream house. And uh, so the more that we apply our sensitivity, our intuition, our gut feeling to, to life and apply it and through writing it down, through you know, uh, an academic process of ourselves, of our own uh, introspection, our own inquiry, we get results in our life and uh, profound results, magnificent results. And when, um, you know, the basics come down to just writing a list, uh, a list of um, two columns. Oh, whoa. Two columns, a column A and a column B. Column A is, is the things we don't like. It's a declaration of the things we don't like, the things we don't want to do. So if it's we want to create a dream job, it, it's best to work with one thing. Just have an intention. I want a, my dream job, my dream spouse, my dream house, or whatever. Apply it to anything you want. So in column A is, um, so if we're looking for a dream job, right? We, first, we're going to declare all the things we don't like in column A. In column B, the things that we do want to be. Um, what we want to have in life or do in life. You know, for mine, my dream job was to do something creative. Back again, I don't know if I told you this, but uh, when I was in the army around year 10 of my 24 year military career, I started to see people get out of the military. Um, uh, one guy was gonna train Rottweilers, uh, another guy's gonna uh, install in ground sprinklers, another guy's gonna deliver flyers, another guy was gonna work overseas. Um, yeah, and so I thought, well, what do I want to do? Yeah, I saw all these cats getting out, and I thought, man, I want to, want to do something. And so I thought, hmm. Again, I just went quiet and listened. And so I right, I want to do something creative, something with my hands, something home-based, internet-based, and involved a bit of travel. And I've since learned extensively to make sure I'm passionate about it. Like Einstein says, nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm. So if you're going to make your list, then really make sure you're you're at it. Do more of that which makes you happy and less of that which doesn't. So that's kind of an important thing because you're going to be at it. And so if you're at it, you might as well like it. And if you, you know, so that's, that's where that. So in column B, though, is the declaration of the things that we do want. A is the things we don't want and B is the things that we do want. So I, for me, it was creative, hands-based internet-based, home-based, bit of travel, and passionate about it. So, and that's where it, I, I came up with knife making and designing and, and um, you know, speaker taining. And that's kind of what this is, because uh, this is what I'm truly, truly geeking out about. And uh, there's so much great information uh, out there, so much great information of uh, life and love and happiness. And, and you know, uh, if you compare the amount of good stuff uh, compared to what we see in the media. The media just seems to have hired and uh, created a, a team of minions that just go out and gather all the negative news in the world. But my gosh, there's so much more goodness going on in the world than what they're portraying. And that's the energy and the field that us, you know, we the people, um, by us creating our reality of not buying into their because us getting mad at them only reinforces and emphasizes that that perspective, right? But that's not the, the case. We don't have to buy into that. We the people, hashtag, can lean into what truly makes us us happy and magnificent and is by firstly stepping up to our, our own game, right? Our own uh, quid pro quo, 
our ergos and when we get into our own thing then that's where the sham wow moment that's the magic of our true uh, expression of ourselves our natural expression and usually it comes back to what we like to do as uh, kids right and so um, so in making a list we're tying into our intuition we have to go inside to the inside world and reflect on firstly the things we don't like like I don't like if we're gonna have our job or, you know for me it's working outside it's things like that and for other people it's other things some people don't want to work outside they want to work alone or they want to work in teams um, etc etc there's um, many of those uh, studies you can go on and to figure out what kind of career best serves you and then the B side is truly the things that we geek out about that make us happy and when we really lean into uh, those things that make us happy you know it, it happens for example look at Chewbacca lady uh, she just had a toy mask of Chewbacca and she's sitting in her car and, and she's completely egg static about it. And, and all she's doing is laughing. Well, that hit the airwaves and we got enrolled in her process of sincere happiness, right? Millions and millions of people, you know, liked and shared this lady just laughing over her own uh, happiness. And that's, that's truly what it's about. And, you know, in my own uh, personal reflections, meditation, stillness, just sitting still and listening to the universe. Uh, I've had visions. I've had, I've seen things. I felt the future of us getting it. I, I, at this cellular level, I've had such profound feelings of the future. I've seen cities where, you know, uh, like when I, when I, on, on my way overseas, you know, we stopped in, um, Germany and uh, I love Germany. I love how everybody over there, you know, has to commit to cleaning their front walks. I love how they turn their cars off at stoplights. You don't see any garbage. I love the lever handles and that, the, the doors. I just, you know, and that's it. We, we have, you know, right now we're living in a field of uh, some dirty birds and poppycockers that uh, think that that's, that's still the way of doing business, but it's not anymore because we're, we're now on a finite, you know, we've grown as a species, as, a, as an organism on our planet. Uh, again, like we discussed earlier, again, life's like an amusement park. There's only one rule. The park opens at 10, the park closes at 10, and what we do between 10 and 10 is up to us. Go for a show, catch a ride, go for lunch, uh, go for a ride, sit on the park bench, right? Regardless, uh, the park's going to close. So what's going to happen between 10 and 10 is up to our choices, but we're in the framework of the park. What happens after the park? Well, uh, some scientists, some atheists, some fundamentalists think that we're one-time consciousness. This is all we get. That's it. That's it, kids. One time. Or uh, the rest of the world thinks that we're infinite energy beings temporarily experiencing uh, infin in infinity, you know, in this mortal uh, body. And so uh, regardless of which camp you're in, I'm, you know, I'm leaning this way, that um, uh, it makes this moment that much more special. And uh, so by truly committed to ourselves by tapping into our intuition what we're really really about it gives us uh, a, a chip in the game a chip on the table it gives us we're, we're playing because we're stepping up to our own plate and uh, uh, I just list, I was listening to some uh, David Hawkins this morning and uh, if you're really into geeky heavy cool stuff about life uh, David Hawkins is, is the man and I, and I loved what he says he says yeah if we're all to get enlightened overnight this place would be boring in a week <laughs> so um, and also he says when we when we step up to our truth we grow stronger or when we when we live with truth or step up to our truth we grow stronger and when we resist or when we uh, yeah resist that our, our, our truth and we grow weak and that's and that's what I'm feeling right now is for myself I now need to uh, passionately share my my wonder of the world because we are living in truly truly amazing times and I just want to share that and help people you know because I get it for myself okay and that's and that's and I'm happy and I'm not here to prove or persuade anybody I just want to share that with a little bit of effort a little bit of um, commitment the accomplishment of any of our goals is assured the moment we commit ourselves. And there is a path to our peace of mind. There is a path to our getting it. Uh, but again, don't take my word for it, but it's just gonna take a, a little bit of work and a little bit of commitment. I've recently had my um, 
chart done, uh, astrological chart done by this super, uh, super talented lady. And, um, you know, in it, it shows, astrology shows us our strengths, but it also shows us our, you know, our weaknesses and where we can truly uh, step up to our plate and, uh, and, and grow. And that's what it provided for me. My chart showed me my, as a Sagittarius, showed me my uh, natural tendencies. And the one thing that I have strong is, is my mutability, my ability to change, uh, change, period, uh, direction, uh, purpose, intention. You know, and, and I said, uh, you know, that, well, I've changed my life over a conversation. And she goes, that's so Sagittarius. And what with that, I've learned that some people are fixed, that, that change isn't really, you know, their natural tendency. So, you know, I, I need to be aware of that and, and really um, be cognizant and also sympathize and empathize with people who's, uh, who don't have that ability to change and be more sympathetic to that um, that that aspect of our of our society that some people aren't easy to change for me change is like a vacation and so um and and the part about being fixed though is in that is that they're also very committed those people are very committed to the long game and i and i get that for sure that being said though is is your is your faith working for you is your creed your ethos your modality working for you and for me i'm about getting at our at our great game getting at our um our higher game the, the game of our own personal truth and when we step up to that truth again that's the shamwell moment like obama and oprah said that uh when they got out of their own way getting letting their ego go and, and I feel the ego is a psychic creature that occupies the, the minds of the unconscious. And when we're unconscious, we're unaware of this psychic creature having a ride with our, with our lives, with our personality, with our, <laughs> our stuff. And then because afterwards, after you go through one of these events, you say, well, I wouldn't have consciously made that choice, right? In a, in a clean state of mind or in a clear head. And that's what the ego does. When we're unconscious, it gives room for this psychic creature to, to exist and to um, have uh, uh, free reign with our lives. So just check that out. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, here's something. Dean Radin, chief scientist of the uh, Institute of Noe Noetic Sciences, and you can check that online, has a bunch of uh, apps and books expressing you know, our intuitive abilities, our intuition. Uh, he did a, a study once with 200 students. Uh, 100 students were believers in our psychic abilities and uh, 100 students were not. So when they ran the test, uh, you know, the, the, the test has four pictures. Uh, and, and so one person's viewing four pictures, one person's sending, one person's receiving the images of those four pictures. And so the most that you can get, not the most, but... Uh, your percentage of chance in using four pictures is um, 25%. And so uh, that's the best that the people, the non, the skeptics, the non-believers could achieve was uh, 25%. Whereas the, the kids, the 100 kids that believed in their intuition and their psychic abilities, because that's all psychic means is another word for intuition. Not a big deal. And then when... Um, uh, they ran the test that uh, these kids were getting uh, average on average 32 and 33 percent scores and for that to be chance uh, Dean tells us that the odds of that happening is in the trillions right so it's not a chance thing that there is a measurable effect and that's what Dean teaches us is that the evidence shows right it's up to us to prove it and that's what science is supposed to do is using their methods of measuring they're supposed to um, meter the world and show evidence it's up to us as the other scientists in the world to prove prove it right or wrong for ourselves and and so for myself i truly have uh, proved it for myself and when i get into the pond cast of synchronicity uh, profound profound evidence in my own life of my own natural intuition and so that's what uh, I'll share in another podcast because that's that's going to take a while. I've got a, a lot of fun stories for that. So Dean shows us through math that we 
uh, have a natural ability. And, and remember what Jesus says, you know, the, the original techno hippie of all time. He says that whatsoever, not him, I think Mark Luke says, whatsoever ye desire, air quotes, believing, ye shall receive. So, right, if you, whoa. So if you believe it, you know, it can, uh, it'll happen. And so that's what Dean's evidence is showing is that, you know, the believers were able to have the, the connection, using their intuition to be able to connect mind to mind uh, in these telepathic experiments. Um, the non, the non-believers, uh, it, it, not so much. So uh, I thought that was truly profound. And what's neat is you can go on to the Institute of Noetic Sciences.org, I-O-N-S.org, and they've got uh, tests, online tests that you can participate with. One is you concentrate on this graph, and it's, it's a graph like this, and, and it runs for 30 seconds. The whole session takes 20 minutes, and you can send your mind to this random number generator, which is a, uh, a chip in a box that basically makes random numbers. And when we focus on that box, um, we can affect it. And that's what this is, like Virgil, uh, Greek, uh, uh, a Greek philosopher. Virgil says, mind moves matter. And here's a man, right? What's really neat is the sages and the mages, the magis, the gurus, um, they've been expressing and describing the quantum subatomic world with, with accuracy and uh, without any means of metering it. And how, and how is that possible, right? There's many poets, prophets, professors, et cetera, et cetera, that now have written down without any of the scientific measuring tools, these metering tools, were able to describe the subatomic world in their poetry. Rumi, for example, the great Syrian poet, uh, Sufi poet, he describes, you know, the quantum world with great accuracy in his, in his poetry. And how is he able to do that? By going within, by being still. When, we, when we're still, we know ourselves and we know the truth of ourselves. This truth sets, our free, sets us free from the perceived dramas and the perspectives of the world. And then we can sail our own boat and sail our own course and be, you know, uh, at, our own, at our own game. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to have a sip. What a beautiful day, man. Beautiful day. Um, oh, so what's neat is uh, current quantum understandings are now showing that um, the, uh, the atom, the molecule now, is actually um, not exactly um, an exact thing, an object per se. It's more of a cloud, a cloud of information. And that's all what we're really dealing with here is information. The whole field, this whole matrix, nature, the divine, the cosmos, is simply just field of information. How so? Well, uh, for example, we perceive the world with light waves. We perceive the world with sound waves, right? And there's a lot more sound that we can actually hear with our own human ears, right? Dogs and cats can hear more. And now we have tools and machines and metering devices that can measure more of the light waves, right? The waves we can't see and, and, and uh, the sounds that we can't hear, right? And so there's even more than that. And we can only meter that much of the sound waves and all these other energy waves. Um, and we can only perceive this much well, when we compare it to infinity, really how much we can actually perceive is, excuse me, is, is it like a cellophane thickness. So there's much more potentiality going on out there than we can even perceive, right? Like, for example, we can't even see the wind, right? And that's still, that's still, I find magical. We can't see the wind, yet it's all around us. We can apply it. And that's where we can... Um, tap into our own potentiality. And that's what's happening is uh, another thing is what uh, Dean Radin so eloquently talks about is this double slit experiments. You know how Virgil says back 2,500 years ago, mind moves matter. Well, now we have this double slit experiment where they take this little photon cannon and it fires photons through two slits. And when we look at the little proton gun firing through the two slits. It makes a pattern on the back wall of, of you know, 
columns, right? When we're perceiving it, but when we're not perceiving it, it makes a cloud. It makes a cloud of dots on the back wall. There's a sensor, sorry. There's two slits, there's the gun, the two slits, and then there's a back sensor here, and the gun's firing, right? And then on the back wall, when perceived, there's columns of hits. When it's not perceived, the back wall shows a, a, a cloud, um, like a shotgun effect, boom, boom. And you can see this experiment uh, online. So when we're observing it, it's it's columns and when we when we're not observing the experiment it's a cloud and that's what you know Niels Bohr Max Planck Heisenberg and Schrodinger and then eventually Einstein um, uh, knew that if the scientist was in the room he was affecting the experiment and now we know that just even thinking of the experiment you're you're affecting it uh, Ingo Swan, uh, Hal Putoff was at uh, the SRI, uh, Stanford Research Institute, uh, I think in 72, and uh, he wanted to see if uh, Ingo, to prove that, if, are we on the right track? So he found uh, uh, a natural psychic and he found Ingo. Ingo was an artist in New York City, very successful, writing books, making art. And um, so they went to the Stanford Research Institute and uh, they had this device called a magnetometer. And when I was a Navy diver, we used magnetometers to find uh, sea mines and torpedoes and other um, uh, metallic objects on the ocean, ocean floor. And so this ma magnetometer was big as a humongous diesel engine, like a train engine. And it was buried, you know, in concrete encased in aluminum uh, shield. Uh, because the thing was used and designed to measure quarks, which are the smallest things that we know. And it's kind of neat that what we, we look for, we find. And so uh, this, this device, this magnetometer, uh, in, in buried in the floor in the basement, um, uh, we can't even, couldn't even get to it, but it was running. And so there's a scientist running it, and, and Hal asked Ingo, hey, can you, can you uh, uh, do something to that magnetometer because it's so sensitive, right? It's measuring and looking for the smallest particles in the known universe. And so Ingo asked, "Where is it?" And Hal said, "It's it's underneath you, five feet in the in the um, in the concrete." And he goes, "Well, what's it look like?" And um, and uh, not what's it look like, but what uh, where was it? And he said, "Okay, well then I'm going to use my my a pen and paper." And so just using. Uh, a pencil he started to draw where he thought it would be and in that moment the magnetometer meter went bloop and the scientist goes what because it had had a stable sine wave for a month a month before that a stable sine wave and as soon as Ingo said right I'm going to uh, perceive wherever it is in space and time bloop and the scientist said whoa 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 hang on a sec what was that and then they and Hal said you know in his elegance says can you do that again and uh, Ingo says, well, let me try. And he started to draw it out, what he was perceiving, and, and the thing spiked again. So then the, the chief uh, engineer scientist of the magnetometer said, okay, everybody out, everybody out, I need to do some tests. There's uh, you know, eight other people in the room, and uh, a couple of them, when, when they saw the, uh, the spike, you know, they ran out of the room because they're all basically atheists. And here's, here's a man, who, and they didn't believe in psychic powers, and here's a man just using the power of his mind affected a device in the floor, right? So that engineer went and he did a, a whack of, um, uh, you know, calibrating and, uh, and board setting of his unit. He said, okay, let's try it again. And uh, Ingo came back with Hal, and uh, sure enough, he was able to affect just by perceiving this magnetometer, he got it to uh, be measured or uh, at least affect it on, the, on his uh, graph. So that started the, uh, basically the remote viewing program back in the early 70s. And, uh, and since then, it's, um, you can go online and see their, their accurate uh, drawings of the, their uh, sessions. Some have been declassified, some of them still haven't been, but the ones that just show that we can do it. And they use this when they had to look for hostages, they were able to perceive, like the one hostage when uh, he was released, um, and uh, I can't remember the name of the, the psychic or the sensitive that was uh, running the session, but the they wanted, because the, the cool part about remote viewing is getting feedback. You need to get feedback to prove your your feelings are correct and that's really important and so um, 
when the, the released hostage read the transcripts of what the uh, remote viewer was perceiving, he says, the only other person that would have known that was the guard in the room. Because, again, it was like Harold Sherman's accounts, you know, day by day, they would check into how were the hostages doing and uh, over a period of months. And uh, the hostage said, again, the only person that could have known that information was the guard in the room. So and he, he was got mad because if you'd known that information, why didn't you come get me sooner? Uh, what else? What else? Again, we're living in amazing, amazing times, my friends. Um, what else? Let's see, we're coming up on 50 minutes. And uh, see, is that about it for now? You don't have to take anything I'm saying, but just check it out for yourself. Again, to do is to know. I'm involved in a uh, remote viewing group, and we do uh, studies online, we do lessons, and then we do application, right? The best way to learn it is to do it. And so I've had uh, several sessions now, I've just started, and in doing so, uh, each time I'm hitting the target, I'm getting information, and it's, um, what we do is ARV, Associated Remote Viewing, and what we use is two pictures, uh, a, a picture A and a picture B, to uh, forecast uh, the decision of an event, be it a sporting event or a uh, um, something on the stock market, right? And so what we do in, in regards to sporting events, because these are events that are going to happen, they're gonna happen in the future. And so when we used to do it on sporting events, rather than trying to tap into the energy of the the team who's going to win and all that what we do is we focus the next day on the newspaper the calm cool collectedness of the newspaper of uh, the who who won right recently Boston just kicked Toronto's butt um, and so in that uh, there's a picture given to team A and a picture given to team B and then uh, so we get our transcripts on the Monday and then we're uh, looking uh, to run our session. So the neat part is um, I'm not focusing on a team. What they give us is uh, how the sessions run is we're given a six figure grid, a six, six number um, designated number. And, um, and the neat part, because it's all about intention. What we're finding is with these scientific studies that the field, our universe just responds mostly to our intention. So what we put out is what we get back. And that's what the scientific research now, the evidence shows, is that we're, uh, it is completely responding to our intention. Am I focusing on the metering device or, or not? And uh, when we do, we do affect it. Mind does move matter. Uh, what else? So what we have is the, uh, the event. Uh, so what we do is we focus on a picture. So I get the, uh, the transcript. I write down that six-figure number, and then uh, there's a cool-down session where I, well, first I do the cool-down, basically relax, just let my mind go, go blank, and just think of nothing. Uh, maybe listen to some Robert Monroe Hemisync, right? Dial in my brain waves uh, to the event, and then uh, I start my session. I write down the number, and then what am I perceiving? And um, the uh, my first one. Uh, Marty Rosenblatt, he runs these sessions, and he has, uh, uh, he was running a session, I was looking at his uh, teachings, uh, a webinar, uh, and it was one from three months earlier, and um, Marty, was he was talking, I was listening on his uh, the YouTube channel, and he said he was talking about because everybody else that was on the webinar already had a profile so they could sign on and get a picture. I didn't have a picture, so I just said, well, I'll use Marty's picture, right? Because he's gonna show his picture at the end of the webinar. So I just focused on Marty's picture. So I did the, uh, the cool down session, and then we, um, oops, and then we uh, ran the session. And, and uh, so you just use a piece of paper. And uh, in doing so, I started to, Without thought, I just felt, I started to draw triangles. And it felt like my pencil was in a, um, like a stencil, you know, the grooves in a stencil, and that's kind of what it felt like. So I started to draw triangles, and then off to the side, I wrote down, hmm, 
red and green car. I don't know where that came from. And then uh, I finished it off with some lines, and but I, I wasn't judging the lines, and that's the key to the when you run your sessions is not to judge it. Because as soon as you judge, you jump to the left side of your brain. Analysis. We need to stay in the the right side of the brain to um, be more open, right? And the left side's judgment, analysis, comparison, right? So we stay away from judgment and just just what am I perceiving? Senses, because you can use all of your senses. They're all connected uh, to the quantum field, the quantum world, waves of potentiality. And then, uh, so once Marty uh, pulled up his picture, what it was was a bridge, like in New York City, and you could see the triangles of the girders. I wasn't drawing the actual girders. I was drawing the negative space of the bridge. Um, and then with the, with these uh, opposed triangles, you know, the tetrahedron look. And then... Um, and then right on the bottom of the picture, you could see two cars. One was red and one was green. And that was my first session. And uh, since then, uh, uh, every session I get some information from the target. The more cool down, the more preparation I do it, the more accurate my, uh, my hits are, which is really, really cool. Again, again, this, this conversation isn't for everybody. You know, if you're happy and you know it, Shamwow. But, you know, if you want to perceive more of the world, and that's all this is, is able to perceive more of, you know, when we ask questions, you, know, you, you can ask yourself anything, and asking it is given is the classic phrase. And if you ask yourself any question, the, the answer is going to come, or whatever you're focusing on is, is, is going to happen. And this has happened to me thousands and thousands and thousands of times now. So, you know, and if I can just share that information with other people that are ready to get at that kind of um, game, and that's all it is, is just a uh, power up, you know, tapping into our own uh, abilities, no different than Mario eating mushrooms. And what's kind of neat that Mario and Luigi eat the Amanita muscario mushroom and they get bigger, they have more powers. And the Amanita has got, it's full of DMT. And that's uh, one of the hallucinogen, uh, entheogen type uh, plants the shamans have been using for thousands and thousands and thousands of years to tap in. And that's what you know, like Ari Shafir says, is that mushrooms are little telephones left behind God to call home. And that's what the shaman does is for thousands of years has used the entheogens, the plant medicines, uh, to tap into nature and find out where the herd is, find out who's sick in the tribe. And, uh, and then the shaman comes back and brings these gifts of understanding. Oh, that's right. In um, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Santa Claus is actually a shaman and he eats the mushrooms and what's neat is he in his mushroom trips usually goes with a family it goes to their their hut and and he brings gifts of wisdom okay and the and he's eating the amanita muscaria which is the red mushroom with the white dots and look at santa claus's um uniform right it's a red uniform with white white big white buttony dots on it um what else is that and uh Oh yeah, so in Lapland, I think that is the reindeer. They uh, they eat the mushroom, or the shaman eats the mushroom, and then the urine. I know it's kind of gross, but it's true. Is they use the urine as also as a uh, so people that want to have that psychedelic effect is they'll drink the shaman's urine, and uh, or the. Uh, reindeer will eat the mushrooms and they'll drink the reindeer urine and it has the same uh, uh, diminished psychedelic qualities of the plant uh, again check that out that's all on on the YouTube and that's what we're finding now is the the um, uh, the plant medicines the psilocybin the DMTs are helping people like myself who've had crazy experiences able to learn to process those experiences and that's what they're finding now and you can go back to the things the Good Friday experiment and how um, you know back in the 60s that's the flower power and all that uh, they started to do psych uh, psychedelic research and showing how that the plants were actually uh, had medicinal qualities that people were able to connect to previous traumatic events and able to uh, rewire and process well, process those events in a uh, healthy harmonious way uh, people with addictions uh, the ibogaine and the ayahuasca uh, which uh, i've done ayahuasca and mushrooms and uh, has provided for me great clarity of these experiences that i've had uh, when I did ayahuasca the first time, it uh, reunited my love for my mother. I was really hard on my mom for years, and that's what sometimes young men do. And then what it did, it totally vaporized that, and I realized, wow, what a 
butthead I'd been and missing out on all this time. And then as soon as I got home, I called mom and we talked for like an hour and a half. And she says that was really one of the nicest conversations we've ever had. And, and since then we had fantastic conversations. So, you know, was that worth $165 and a few hours of my time to get that love back for my mother? Absolutely, absolutely. I wanted to get out on the pond today before uh, we've got rain coming. Again, the beauty of living in Newfoundland is if you don't like the, the weather, wait five minutes or uh, drive five miles. So, uh, there we go. Let's turn this boat around. Um, what else? What else am I studying these days? Um, I think that's about it. The uh, I love the current quantum understandings that are basically proving what the... Uh, the shaman have been saying all along that uh, what we put out is what we get back, what we focus on, we attract, that mind does move matter. Um, that we have telepathic mental abilities to tap into when we're open to it. We can tap into any person, place, or thing in space or time. Have you ever been, oh, well, for example, um, I was uh, about, what, well, it must be eight years ago now, I was uh, brushing my teeth and... Uh, all of a sudden I thought of my friend Darren and the last time I thought of Darren we were on this uh, exercise on an airplane and uh, oh my god I haven't thought of Darren since that last X and then uh, I finished brushing my teeth I go to my my email inbox there's an email from Darren I hadn't heard of Darren in 10 years so that's that's our ability to perceive things uh, you know outside of our body and that's what Rupert Sheldrake uh, the eminent Rupert Sheldrake talks about in he's a biologist and he shows how dog owners know when their masters are coming home and I think we talked about that uh, it's on YouTube you can check that out and the the feeling of being stared at again more great evidence of our uh, connection to everything and er everyone uh, in space or time so uh, again you don't have to take my word for it you know but when we deny ourselves that sensitivity, it's like denying ourselves our sight and our hearing. Uh, we, we, you know, uh, and we've just been really dumbed down just through, but it's also been our choice to allow ourselves to have been dumbed down as well, right? You go to some cultures around the world, the indigenous peoples, and how, you know, they still have maintained their connection to nature and maintained their connection to the uh, subatomic level. We all doing it anyways, but what we focus on, we attract. And if we're full of matter and we're stuck in our mind and our left brain of judgment then we can't really be open in our right brain to being open to the arts the sensitivities the music the pictures the sounds of <laughs> of of the world around us you know judgment is the thief of joy and when we're stuck in judgment you know we're doing analysis and comparison we're not being present in our heart and that's the uh neatness of it is to and again just try it out for yourself just sit still and watch what happens when you go to label something, there's a there's a movement from being present to it, being omni, and being uh, around it, uh, to as soon as we judge something, there's a, a physical feeling of going from here in our heart, in our belly, to judging up in our mind. And when we sit still, uh, we can feel that. We can feel that uh, mechanism of our own body of its uh, of it happening by us. Um, judging just by judging and, and and we know that now from the quantum uh, experiments the physicists have done that just by thinking of it 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 affects it right mind moves matter hashtag Virgil so uh, that's it just you're amazing uh, you're an amazing being on this planet you've already won the lottery you're one in 14 million spermoids that that made it to the egg right so and that's kind of neat that the lottery is one in 14 million. So you've already won the lottery. You're already in the game. So, you know, make the best of it by, you know, leaning into more of that which makes you happy. You know, that's what I try to do on a daily basis is really work at what makes me happy. And in doing so, I get the, the chamois effect of that, you know. Uh, I think that's it. Uh, just let me check my notes. Oh, uh, no, 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 uh, uh, uh. Oh yeah, so uh, uh, Carl Sagan and Ingo Swan, uh, the the Voyager probe was going to go past Uranus and Jupiter, or sorry, Saturn and Jupiter, back in like '74. Don't quote me on the year, but back in the '70s. And uh, so Ingo thought, hey, I'll remote view Jupiter. And Saturn before it gets there I'll run a session so 
uh, Ingo runs his session, writes down his information, and uh, when the Jupiter probe gets there, or the Voyager probe gets there a couple of years later, and they're cruising past Jupiter, the uh, uh, the points that Ingo brought up that Jupiter does have rings uh, and, uh, and a bunch of other uh, points I can't remember right now, uh, they were there. I think he had like eight out of ten out of hits of remote viewing a planet, right? So distance isn't an issue here. Time isn't an issue here. Um, one of the remote viewers, uh, I think Russell Targ, not, I mean the scientist Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, I can't remember which one, they were doing a session and they sent the outbound viewer to uh, 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 an old water plant, right? Uh, but it was a water plant that was current and so Ingo, I think it was Ingo that ran the session and what he perceived was this plant but he drew um, that there was two large uh, tailings ponds or uh, cooling tanks and but when they uh, brought the information back there was actually today currently there was only one of these big water pools tanks and so uh, years later uh, someone had sent I think Russell Targ uh, a photograph of the that treatment plant from back in the day back in the 1860s or 1880s or something like that and back in that picture it shows that there was actually two of these tailing ponds or these cooling pools and uh, so right you can't see that today because there's a parking lot where one of these pools is so there's the evidence that shows that they perceive that everything's waves of potentiality or not waves of potentiality but that information is still there that somewhere in the field of information that that information is still accessible and that's what you know we're able to do oh a bit of rain yeah and uh, that's what we're able to do is tap into that information for example just want to share is that right now this present moment is is where the collapse of the wave function happens that the present moment the now and that's you know it took me years to figure this out and this is as much as i can understand it at this point it's just kind of deep is that uh they talk about the wave function collapsing right the waves of energy sound waves the light waves um just checking my phone it's just raining and so what's happening oh, cover my book up All right, and um, so there's waves of potentiality, and what happens is, uh, like this classic phrase, uh, if a tree falls in the forest, uh, is it heard, right? Well, um, when we perceive something, that's the moment of those waves of potentiality collapsing, and we're perceiving it. We're perceiving the, uh, the moment now, and those waves of potentiality, be it whatever ways we're tapping into through our senses, eyes, nose, ears, mouth, that it, it collapses into this moment and it's being observed in this present moment. So this moment is such a, in, in, a, in a, the realm of frequencies, is just a moment, right? And, and before this moment, I've got drawings, I'll show you later, um, is just waves of potentiality. So it kind of looks like a vessel traveling through water. And that's not the right picture, but that right now we're perceiving the world and this is where the that wave function collapses, and we're perceiving it. Um, did I explain that right? Yeah. So, and that's it. So, in the present moment, that wave collapse, the waves collapse, and it becomes a particle. And then we perceive the particles, and that's what we're perceiving now, is just particles of information. So, sound waves, light waves, uh, tactile is just information it's all just feedback and data that we're getting from our perceptions from perceiving the environment around us okay i think that's about it for now uh the rain's here and i wanted to get out before the rain came so again thank you very much guys uh i love your love your questions i love your support and again we are living in amazing times and again this is only my best guess Okay, and uh, this is the stuff that I'm geeking out about these days. And again, because I've had the luxury, you know, I did my 24 years 
and I've been out now seven or ten plus years and I'm just thankful to have this luxury to be able to study this stuff and share it with you guys um, I believe in you you're, you're, you're the shamwell you're the skizzy anyways guys have a have a great day I love you guys and um, um, yeah be well live well be kind <laughs> okay ciao bye for now guys